Hello everyone, welcome to the video. We are the Medieval Mythbusters. Now, we have come together as a team to help you understand what is correct and what is not correct about medieval warfare, culture and society. Today we're going to do a video on the top five myths about warfare and equipment. I'm Thomas from Medieval Review and I'm going to talk about some common myths of European medieval armour. Hello everyone, this is the Metatron speaking. Today we're going to talk about the Samurai. I'm Shad Brooks from the YouTube channel Shadowversity and I'll be addressing the five most common ways on how to tie your shoelaces with your teeth. Okay, I'm really talking about the five most common sword myths. And I, myself, Little Old Anthony Cummins, I'm going to take you through the ninja and everything wrong with that. I hope you enjoy the video. All the information you need will be down below in the link, so come see us and I hope you enjoy this myth busting about medieval times. Ninjutsu is not hand-to-hand -hand combat. Many people believe that the art of the ninja, ninjutsu, is hand-to-hand -hand combat. This does not appear anywhere in any historical text. It was created in the 1950s, 1960s by one man and then it burst onto the world scene from that point. One of the most common myths about medieval armour is that a full suit of it could only be worn by a knight. Now, there's a lot of reasons this myth may exist, uh, some of which I'll actually talk about later on in this video, but I think the primary reason is that people thought it was class restricted. Now that's actually just not the case. Medieval knights, sure, they would wear armor, but they weren't the only ones. Uh, mercenaries wore it, brigands wore it, even a tailor, as long as he could afford it, could buy and wear a full suit of armor. In fact, the exact opposite of the myth is actually the most commonplace thing, where a lot of times people were required to at least wear most of, if not an entire suit of armor, for the purposes of going to battle. So no, it was not class restricted at all. The first point I'd like to cover is that of weapons. What was the weapon of choice of the samurai class? Of course, when we think about the samurai, the first weapon that comes to mind is a katana. And mind you, this is not a katana. This beast here is an odachi, but it still helps us out imagine what we're talking about. Now, um, the reason for that, the reason why the katana has become, or the sword in more in general, has become the ineluctable companion of all samurai and the weapon of choice is because of Hollywood and video games. They have popularized this idea of the sword being the most important weapon and the first weapon of choice of the samurai. Now, the katana was an important weapon, it was an important symbol for the samurai class. It was the last resort, meaning that there were other weapons that would have been more important and effective on the battlefield. The katana was used and worn by the samurai while roaming town, for example. But on the battlefield, the samurai would use either pole arms, meaning yari, spears, and naginata, bladed spears, shall we say, and, most importantly, the bow. Yumi, because please do keep in mind that the samurai were not only mounted forces trained for hand-to-hand -hand combat, but they were also, if not primarily, archers, meaning ranged units. I guess I have to pull it and then leave it. <laughs> so the first subject to address is the matter of weight. The weight of swords is very misunderstood. There are some swords that are considered to be crude and heavy and other swords that are considered to be particularly light and nimble. Now granted, there are some swords that look as light as they appear, for instance the small sword, but in regards to the standard one-handed and two-handed types of swords that you see in many different cultures, their weights are very comparable. Most swords weigh around 1.1 to 1.2 kilos. European army swords, the average weight 1.1 kilos. The katana, that ranges between between 1.1 to 1.3 kilos of the European longsword, that's about 1.1 to 1.8 kilos. The weight of the rapier also sits around that 1 kilo mark. You see, the rapier is generally considered a light sword, but that's a misconception because they have transferred weight, they have not removed weight. So instead of taking away weight from the blade and just leaving it, they take away weight from the blade and it's added to the handle, the protection. You see, weight is a very misunderstood thing when it comes to swords. Just because a sword is a little bit heavier than other swords doesn't mean it's worse. In some cases, and indeed a lot of cases, that can mean that it is a better sword and has greater cutting capacity. In addition to that, a sword that is technically lighter can feel heavier if it has poor balance, and a sword that is technically heavier can feel lighter than swords that are also technically lighter if it has good balance. And good balance doesn't mean being close to the hilt, that's a misconception. Good balance means the sword is balanced in the right way to complement the way in which it is supposed to be used. 
The ninja suit is a myth. Well, kind of. The ninja suit, as you think of it, is actually just traditional Japanese clothes. And actually, wearing a mask in Japan is not that out of a uh, sort. It is seen in Japan, and there are many different types of masks. So having black clothes, having Japanese clothes, and wearing a mask does not make you a ninja. In fact, you could probably see that in old Japan. What is suspicious is actually hanging around from the roof beams dressed in black in the middle of the night. That's the suspicious bit, not wearing a mask. Now, it doesn't mean that ninja didn't wear this, it just means that ninja would wear different things for different situations. So did ninja ever wear the ninja mask? It's still yet to be discovered, but in actuality, most historical documents point to the fact that they wore nothing on their faces. A lot of people think that armor in the Middle Ages was extremely heavy and limited the mobility of the person wearing it, to the point that they would actually need a crane to lift them up onto their own horse. But that's actually not the case at all. In fact, mobility and weight were key concepts in armor design. And throughout the entirety of the Middle Ages, someone wearing a full suit of armor of different varying types could weigh anywhere between 40 pounds to 70 pounds. That's roughly 18 kilograms to 32 kilograms. It's actually not as much weight as you'd think when it's distributed all over your body. To give you a modern day comparison, that 40 pounds is about what a modern day firefighter wears, and that 70 pounds, modern day military soldier. And they are both mobile, so the person in the Middle Ages wearing a full getup of armor, they could run up a hill, fight a battle, and even jump on their own horse. Well, Maybe not so much Henry VIII, because he was a pretty large guy. He might have needed a crane even without armor. No sources to back that one up. The second point I'd like to bring up is that of armor. Now, samurai armor is a big misunderstood topic again, and I notice that one of the most interesting misconceptions that I find on forums and blogs is that of samurai armor being extremely lighter if compared to European armor. Now, this statement doesn't make sense for a simple reason. What century are we talking about and what area in Europe are we talking about? Now, if we don't answer to these two specific questions, then our um, statements will not have any academic weight. For instance, if we take um, Tose Gusoku or modern armor, so we are already in the 16th century, um, like the full set of armor that I own that you can see here. This is probably the samurai harness that most people imagine when they think of a samurai. Now this kind of armor, again 16th century, um, is a, a lighter counterpart if we compare it to uh, same period um, European armor, so if we compare it to full plate armor. Now the armorers in Japan at that time they had started to tailor the armor at the waist considering the fact that you would bear most of the armor's weight on your hips supported by your core which is a common point uh, by the way with the European armor but samurai armor is uh, lighter after all mostly because of the fact that there is no mail underneath most of the times the protection for the arms is basically cloth little bit of mail and some plates but if we look at, for example, 12th century, 10th century knight armor, then we're talking about mainly uh, male armor, excuse me, the pun. So um, what was the armor in, issued to the samurai at that time in Japan? Well, we've got yoroi and oyoroi. Now, if we consider oyoroi, for example, then at that period, samurai armor would have been a lot heavier than European armor. So it really depends on what period we're talking about. As a matter of fact, if we look at these pictures, you can see that the uh, pauldrons are considerably bigger than the torse gusoku that I own. And the door or cuirass is not tailored at the waist. They did not have that uh, sort of technology at that time. Thus, most of the weight of the armor would be borne on the shoulders. No type of sword is indestructible. They all chip, dent, bend, and break, regardless of how they are made or where they come from. And, and, on, and on that note, where it is made does not automatically determine if it is a good sword or it is a bad sword. Regardless of the cultural location, whether that be Europe, Asia, the Middle East, or India, they all made swords at the highest quality they could with the techniques they had, and at the same time, they also made poor quality swords. They, no culture made all their swords to a set specific standard that every 
everyone achieved. And even those swords that were made to the highest level of quality that could be achieved out of the material that they were made out of, still broke. You see, swords can only be as strong as the material that they are made out of. Now, of course, purity, crystalline structure, quenching and tempering process can affect it to make it a superior or durable blade, but that only becomes particularly important when the blade is put under significant stress, which is the very thing you would want to avoid. If used regularly, a sword will not last a lifetime. Ninja did not invent the shuriken. Okay. For some reason, everybody believes that the shuriken is part of ninja history. It's not. The shuriken has its own history inside of Japanese history. There is only one document to date that actually has a shuriken in it that is connected to the ninja. And by context, in the document, it's more about criminal capture. Uh, I.e., you know, capturing somebody who's running away or you've cornered them. So, if you want to understand this, think of shuriken being in Japan and that the ninja may or may not have used them, but they were not invented by the ninja, nor are they a special ninja weapon. Another really common myth about armor in the Middle Ages is that it was prohibitively expensive and only the very wealthy could afford it. That's not the case at all. If you look at the average income for the middle class person, which would have been maybe like a tailor, they could afford a brand new suit of what we would call munitions grade armor on just a year's salary. And honestly, they probably wouldn't buy it all at once anyway. They'd probably buy it piecemeal. Brand new breastplate and helmet, the key things you may need, that would only cost you about a third of your income. And your life depended on it. Think about what we buy today, cars and houses, and our lives aren't necessarily dependent on it because someone's not gonna try to kill us with a sword. Now, you also have to keep in mind that there is a very lucrative used armor business. Repurposed armor, handed down armor, inherited armor, all sorts of armor was out there and available for people to get, and they could get it on the cheap. So no, not just for the very wealthy. Third point on this list, samurai did not practice karate. Most of the martial arts that we have in mind when we think of Japanese combat um, did not exist. Uh, karate, to mention one, was introduced to Japanese isles from Ryukyu, meaning the area where Okinawa's main island is in the south of Japan, was introduced to the Japanese main islands around the 20th century and it is a relatively modern martial art. Basically the same goes for all martial, Japanese martial arts that finish with the idogram Do, which means way, meaning inner way. Now this is all impressive, but what sort of combat training did the samurai have then if these martial arts weren't around at that time? So for example, Jujutsu was uh, one of the martial arts practiced by the Bushi, meaning the warrior class, meaning the samurai. Then we would have Kyujutsu, the way of the bow, and Kenjutsu, which was the way of the sword. Sophisticated sword-based martial arts have existed in every single culture where they were prominent, not just in Asia. That includes Europe, the Middle East, and also India. And what's interesting to note about these martial arts is that there are a lot of similarities between the two, because at the end of the day, the sword is a sharp, metal, pointy thing on a handle. Now granted, these martial arts are very deep and sophisticated, but you do need to understand that any logical person, when they look at this weapon and try and figure out the best ways to use it, from practice and experience from actually fighting this thing, many people from different cultures are actually going to figure out the same things. If you're ever in a situation where you need to use this weapon to save your own life, you're gonna bet that people have practiced with them to make sure that they can use it effectively. So to think that there was any culture where swords were used to a significant level that didn't train or practice or figure out more effective ways in which to use them is completely ridiculous. You will find certain techniques in every single style, some that work better than techniques in other styles, and at the same time, in the same style, you will find techniques that work worse than other techniques in other types of styles. There was no one style that was universally superior than all other sword-based martial arts. And on that note, it isn't particularly the style that will determine if someone will be successful in it. It is the skill of the practitioner, okay? It is the skill that they have in their style that will determine if someone is successful at using it. The ninja is not the enemy of the samurai. This idea of samurai versus ninja is a myth. 
The ninja are in fact a part of the samurai army and they are known as shinobi no mono. Now their job is espionage, commando tactics, infiltration, propaganda. They could be from the samurai class, they could be lower than the samurai class or they could be half samurai, sometimes doshin or ashigaru. But the point here is that shinobi or ninja are inside of the samurai system. Vikings wore helmets with huge horns, right? No. In fact, historical records don't have any mention of that anywhere, and archaeological evidence, what little there is of Viking helmets, suggests quite the opposite, that they liked streamlined helmets that were very close fitting to the head. So where did this common portrayal even come from? Thankfully, that's actually very easy to track. You see, back in the 1800s, there was a Scandinavian artist named Gustav Malmström, and he first depicted them as wearing helmets with huge horns. But that wasn't popularized yet. That didn't happen until Wagner put on his epic opera of Der Ring des Nibelungen. Yeah, it's kind of hard to say. But... In that opera, he had a costume designer named Carl Emil Doppler. And Doppler made that image of the horned helmet the popular portrayal that stuck in the psyche of the modern man. And we've had it ever since. But no, Vikings didn't put horns on their helmets. They needed the horns for drinking their mead, right? Bushido did all samurai follow this honor code. Moral codes uh, for the warrior class have been present since the beginning of samurai combat, um, but the code evolved and changed over time. What is important to say is that when we ask the question, did samurai follow Bushido, we should ask ourselves, what do we mean by Bushido? Bushido is a set of moral rules, but moral rules based on the morality of ancient Japan. So we do need to understand, I don't have in this brief video a time to explain all moral rules in ancient Japanese um, society. The most important thing was loyalty to your lord. Being loyal to your lord could have meant having to do things that normally a samurai wouldn't really do. Okay, so sometimes there is a balance that needs to be understood. Would a samurai do this? No, yes, not that easy to say. It depends on circumstances and it depends on the context. Swords were rarely picked as primary battle for weapons because of their inherent weakness against metal armor. Now it's true that more tapered pointed end swords or thrust centric swords can be still effective against heavily armored opponents, but there are other weapons that are far more superior at combating heavily armored opponents than what a sword is. And so because of that, the sword wasn't used as a primary battlefield weapon. Indeed, things like the spear or pole arms were used far more than the sword, but the sword is very convenient because you can hang it at your hip so easily. And so it was often carried as a backup weapon in case someone lost their primary weapon, but where the sword really shines and where it was used more predominantly throughout history was as a weapon for self-defense. And why is that the case? Well, carrying a sword around with you isn't that difficult, but wearing metal armor all day, that is. And off the battlefield, of course, no one ever did it. That meant that a sword was still very, very effective in a civilian environment, and indeed, that's where we see that they were used more often. Right, the ninja are just not trained assassins. By that I mean they were not born into a family, they grew up learning assassination and then they were hired out to go and assassinate people. That's not true. The best way to look at this is like James Bond. James Bond is taken for his skill and ability and he's trained to be a spy commando, someone who infiltrates or also does classic spy work. Occasionally they will use James Bond to make an assassination. This is the same with the shinobi and the ninja. Basically, they are spies and commando infiltrators. Occasionally, they may be called upon to do assassinations, but it's not their primary role. What I think is the biggest myth about medieval armor is that the only good armor was made of metal. That's actually not the case. I mean, certainly, while the metal armor, such as mail or plate, were extremely good at protecting the individual wearing it, 
it wasn't necessary in all cases. In fact, a gambeson made of only 10 layers of linen, which isn't all that thick, about a finger's width, could actually stop a sword blow and protect the person from being cut. That's actually really impressive, and there have been modern tests done to actually test this with extremely sharp swords, and the linen will stop them. And only the strongest cut can really get through. So those glancing blows, you don't necessarily even need to have the mail for it. The problem was the piercing blows, the arrows, the thrust from a sword. Those were really mattered to begin wearing some of that mail and a lot of that plate. But no, it wasn't just limited to the metal. Cloth could work just fine in a pinch. This brings us to our last point. Would a samurai use a gun? Now in this case, this is a, a Tanegashima Teppo, a matchlock type arquebus or musket, if you will. Now, um, I've read lots of people saying and stating that a samurai would never use a gun because it would be dishonorable. The guns were introduced in the 16th century, at the end of the 16th century, and from Portugal, um, well, Portugal, India, Portuguese India, but yeah, from Portugal. And the Japanese loved them to bits. Japanese warlords started mass producing these. And who were they issued to? To the Ashigaru, so the uh, foot soldiers, and to the samurai class. Hold on a second. But a samurai is an honorable warrior. He's following Bushido. How can their warlords give them this weapon which is dishonorable? I mean, it's a heinous thing to just take advantage of distance and shoot them. Absolutely not. Um, a samurai, again, is a ranged uh, warrior. You shoot them with an arrow and you kill them. You shoot them with a gun and you kill them. To the Japanese warlords, that didn't make much difference at all. Um, so, um, yes, the samurai were issued these. They were banned eventually in the Edo period, but that's because it was a period of peace, so you don't really need these in a period of peace. But during the Sengoku Jidai, the Sengoku period, Oda Nobunaga used these. He issued his samurai. Even the Tageda clan announced less spearmen, more gunmen. How a sword is manufactured has no relevance at all to how sharp it can become. Where it does become important in regards to its manufacturer is how long it will be able to maintain that sharpness. And that means you can have a sword that is made out of pure iron and have it be just as sharp as a sword that is made out of properly tempered carbon steel. The iron sword will simply lose its sharpness quite quickly in comparison to the other type of sword. And on that note, you don't always want a sword to be as sharp as it possibly can be. Why? Because the sharper the sword is, the more fragile the edge is as well. And so if you want an edge to be more durable, you wouldn't make it as sharp as it possibly could become. You see, a sword does not need to be sharp enough to shave with to do the damage that swords are commonly ascribed to being able to do. Sharp enough is sharp enough, and anything more than that is actually overkill. I hope you enjoyed that. We've had Metatron, we've had Medieval Review, and we've had Shad, all of us doing our own subjects. I hope you've enjoyed it. Please, if you're interested, click below. There's links to everyone's channel there because we've all shared this on our channels. If you enjoy medieval history, pass this around and we will do more collaborations in the future with this medieval myth-busting team. So I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you have a good day. See you later.